Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending today's webinar brought to you by Casablanca Finance City and Boston Consulting Group. Thank you for joining us today. If uh, you are new to uh, these events, if this is uh, your first time with us, welcome. My name is Manel Bernoussi. I am from Team CFC, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Let's give a few moments for our audience to jump in. You have been so many to register, over 150, and we are really, really excited about that. Welcome, everyone. Hello to you, Sofia, Job, Avijit, Farid. Welcome to all of you, Bilal, Mehdi. We can see you all connecting. That's great, Jean-Francois Thomas, welcome. Once you have joined, please drop us a message below in the chat box to say hi. Tell us, tell us which city you're connecting from, which company or industry you're representing. Send us some energy. We'd love for this session to be interactive and uh, we wanna make sure we are bringing some real value. We'll be spending the next 75 minutes together. This program will end around 11.15 Morocco time, 12.15 uh, Rwanda time. And I can't wait for you to see what's next. Okay, before we um, get started, welcome everyone. Awesome. We're seeing more connections, more people coming in. So before we get started, I'd like to give uh, the audience a quick overview of the Zoom platform we're using today. This is a very unique opportunity to make the, the, the most of the time we're spending together. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you will notice some Zoom features. Most important button there is the Q&A widget. This is where we ask questions during the webinar. And if you have a, a question for a specific speaker, please uh, make sure to type his or her name first and then your question in the Q&A box so I know who to direct it to. I would like to uh, encourage you to submit your questions at any time. For those of you who would prefer to type their questions in French, that's perfectly fine. The team and I will make sure to translate them for our international audience. There is this is also a unique opportunity for you to interact, even though we cannot see each other, but um, there's a whole team back here that is really going through all your comments. I can see Murad has started interacting with some of you. That's awesome. So we are reading all those comments one by one. Please make sure to use that chat box. Tell us about yourself. From what I have seen in the registration list, we have a lot of expertise in the audience. Please honor us with your insights, share with us in the chat box below your own perspective, your own experience. And if you wanna go further, you wanna use Twitter or LinkedIn, you can use our hashtags, hashtag CFC event or hashtag CFC community. All right, we are almost done getting ourselves ready. Today's program is being recorded. Um, just tag the QR code you're seeing on the screen right now. It will take you right to our YouTube channel where you can access the replay once it's been uploaded. So now, without further ado, it's time to get things started. And it is my privilege to introduce to you the CEO of Casablanca Finance City, Mr. Saeed Ibrahimi, for his welcome note. Thank you, Manal. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to the launch of our sixth Africa Insight report. This time we are delighted to team up. It's not the first time really, uh, with the, a leading consultancy firm, Boston Consulting Group. I can recall that back in 12, 2012, a long time ago, BCG was one of the first companies to join our CFC community. And uh, since then, uh, Casablanca's office has been on an impressive journey. Congrats to you, Patrick, and the entire team. Our latest publication is entitled uh, Rising to the Digital Challenge in Africa. 
and tackles the theme of digital transformation in our continent. The pandemic has already and will have a disruptive and long lasting effect on the way we live, interact and run our day-to-day -day operations. Yet COVID-19 is also a silver lining and offers tremendous opportunities to be seized by those who can quickly adapt and rethink their business models. In just a few months time, the COVID-19 crisis has brought about years of change in the way companies in all sectors and regions do business. We have confirmed this trend within our CFC community as a recent survey we conducted has shown how most companies are now rising to the digital challenge, both from within and in their way of operating across sectors. As a leading finan African financial center, we at Casablanca Finance City have the conviction that we have a role to play in establishing a business-friendly environment and enabling value creation by encouraging cutting-edge innovation. Africa has already proved with the mobile revolution and innovations like M-Pesa that Africans too can be dynamic and innovative players in the global economy, transcending the continent's current reliance on raw material exports. Our friends from Rwanda are already using drones to transport medical supplies, and they are working on creating a high-tech ecosystem centered around innovation and talent. We are happy to hear more today from Kigali Innovation City about this promising endeavor. So there is overall a promise of leapfrogging that we all need to fulfill. Before ending my note, I would like to thank all the panelists that have joined us today to share their insights. Special thanks once again to BCG for them, their continuous support and involvement. And I wish you all a great webinar. Over to you, Manal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Said, for these words. There is indeed an overall promise that we all need to fulfill. Now, I would like to turn to someone who has been close to Casablanca Finance City every step of the way. Patrick Dupoux is senior partner at Boston Consulting Group and head of the Africa operations. He opened BCG's Casablanca office in 2010. Actually, I'm realizing that both CFC and BCG are celebrating their 10th anniversary this year. I'm so glad we're doing so through this publication. As mentioned by Saeed, the Casablanca office has been on an impressive journey these past 10 years. There are over 100 employees from 10 different nationalities. And from here, Patrick and his team helped assignments for leading public and private sector institutions in Morocco and beyond in Africa. Patrick, it's great to have you here with us today. The floor is all yours. Thank you, uh, Manal. Uh, and well, <clears throat> BCG Casablanca is um, is having its tenth anniversary, but you know BCG was existing before BCG Casablanca. So we are older now uh, than ten years. But it's true that we've been together with uh, with uh, Casablanca Finance City since uh, since the very beginning. And you said that uh, very kind words about uh, how we grew. Uh, our Casablanca office over the last years and make it a, a hub to Africa and especially in the digital uh, space. Um, but it's true that CFC also has, has been quite uh, showing an impressive growth. Uh, I think in tw 2012, uh, that was quite a big, uh, bit of a bet to create a hub in Casablanca. And I think uh, right now uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite impressive how you have grown and how this uh, ecosystem and this community has grown. And the fact that we have both uh, grown uh, shows the value of what we call ecosystems. It's that it's a win-win for all participants. Um, so digital, obviously, I will not repeat. I think everyone is aware is absolutely key. 
uh, it's uh, you know the major uh, you know uh, revolution that uh, impacts the, the the way we are doing business everywhere in the world uh, and the next wave of productivity in the in the global economy i think we all know about you know why digital is a, is an opportunity for africa uh, for the leapfrogging opportunities uh, and, and how it could spur uh, an accelerated economic growth uh, but what i would like to remind is the fact that you know this covid crisis uh, really accelerated the trend huh? at least by two three years it hasn't created a trend uh, maybe except uh, you know uh, uh, some some of the ways of working but it's completely accelerated the trend, uh, but it's also raised the expectations from consumers, from uh, workers, from companies in terms of digital services. Uh, it raised the bar in terms of competition. Uh, and the consequence is to win in this digital world in the future. We also need, we being Casablanca, Morocco, Africa, and all of us in this, uh, in this video conference, in this, in this webinar, we need to up our game. So the expectations will be higher and higher. Um, competition is really growing fast. Um, and we see that, you know, there will be winners and there will be losers. Um, right now, we could, we could argue that Europe is losing in the, uh, especially AI uh, race uh, with, uh, you know, and, and digital race with 20 of the largest 20 uh, digital native firms uh, being from either uh, USA or China, and none of them in Europe. So that's quite worrying. There will be winners and losers, and um, and it's absolutely critical for Africa to make sure that uh, that this is a, an opportunity rather than than um, you know just a given. Uh, so I will I will um, you will hear from uh, Aman about the work and the study we've been uh, doing. Just to maybe a few words about why digital is also critical to us at BCG. Today, it's about 40% of our, of our work uh, globally. And in Casablanca, it's even more than 40%. And I would say that 10 years ago, we were doing 90% of our work in Morocco. Today, Morocco is less than half of what we're doing. We are really using Casablanca as a hub to Africa. And we're doing more outside of Morocco than in, uh, in Morocco. Uh, and digital was, uh, and I would say at the time, it was IT. and uh, and digital was maybe five, ten percent. Today, it's close to half of what we're doing in two ways. And we have two two hubs. We have a, a hub for data sciences and artificial intelligence in uh, Casablanca, leveraging the outstanding quality of um, of uh, you know Moroccans in uh, in the field of uh, of uh, AI and data sciences. Uh, and that this hub serves Africa and beyond. Uh, we have global competency centers that actually. Uh, serve BCG worldwide and, uh, and firms all, all across the, the planet. And we are also uh, building and accelerating on the creation of a digital hub, more in the sense of IT, IT legacy, IT architecture, uh, digital app, and so on. And for example, this year, we have launched three digital ventures from scratch in Morocco. Uh, and some of them are already among the the, the most downloaded apps in the, in the country. Uh, so this is absolutely critical to us. Uh, and we think this is, this is the future. And again, CFC is critical to our success for building BCG Casablanca, but also for building our hub. Uh, without uh, CFC and the, what it brings in terms of the ease of doing business, uh, getting work permits and so on, it would be difficult for us to build this hub and to attract and keep and retain uh, the top digital talents in uh, Casablanca. So over to you, Aman and, uh, and Manal, and then Aman and, uh, and the teams for the, for the webinars, and I hope you will enjoy the session. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patrick, for your words. Thanks again for your support uh, throughout all these years. Thank you, uh, Patrick and Said, for your welcome notes. And now the time has come, ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to unveil our latest CFC Africa Insights publication. This has been in the making for a while now. And we're so excited to share with you some of the key insights. You'll have a link to download the full report later on. So please make sure you stick with us till the end. And for the keynote presentation, um, we are proud to have one of the authors himself. And then Danuni is Managing Director and Partner at Boston Consulting Group. 
Prior to Casablanca, he has worked in the Paris, Singapore, and Kuala Lumpur offices and served clients across many continents. He is passionate about technology and has a deep interest in foreseeing how greater economic and social value can be unlocked by developing the right set of digital enablers. His TED Talk on how digital platforms can help local economies has been viewed more than two million times. So go check that out. Aman, it's great to have you here today. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks, Manan, and thanks for the, the kind words. Um, it, it, indeed, it's, it's, I'm a passionate uh, believer in, in digital, and I'll, I'll be happy to have the discussion even beyond what we're sharing in, in the report today. Uh, but hopefully the discussion we're going to have in the next four, 45 minutes will enlighten some of us and probably ignite some passion in those who, who are attending. Absolutely. We're looking forward to that. So can you please walk us through the context, the challenges, and some of the key findings of, the, of your publication? Sure. So, so maybe the, the starting point I want to have, and, and, and it's a conversation that I had a um, few weeks ago with one of, the, one, one of our clients in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and he was saying something that I found so true. Uh, you, you can't understand Africa if you don't live Africa. And the interesting thing also is that sometimes even for those of us who are living in Africa, there are some topics or some angles where it's hard to understand Africa, even though you're living it. And we took it upon us in, in BCG to every year put the spotlight on one of those difficult to understand topics because of the diversity of the continent, the complexity of the topic itself. Uh, we've done that before with the African challengers. Uh, there was another year we did it with the African integration. Last year was about um, the impact of online marketplaces uh, on, on the job market in Africa. And that was actually the topic of the TED talk. And this year with our friends in, in CFC, what we wanted to do is to unravel a little bit the topic of digital rise in, in Africa. Where are we really, what is the momentum we're seeing and where we're hitting? And maybe if I start with the, with the first topic, which is where we are, right? An, an honest uh, assessment of where we see Africa today and if we can move to two slides later, um, the, the initial elements you wanna look at is how is the overall technology infrastructure, right? Um, and maybe the, the slide will appear in a second. It doesn't appear on my, on my screen yet. Yeah, great. Um, so maybe the following one uh, or two slides later. Yeah, the next one. Yeah, great. So, so the first point is when you look at, at the hard measures, right? Uh, you need infrastructure to at least talk about technology and digital. And whether you look at connectivity, 3G, 4G, number of people covered, by any measures, we know that Africa is behind, right? We, we are clearly underdeveloped on the ICT infrastructure side. But the question we wanted to ask ourselves is how does that translate or not to how companies themselves are digitizing their world, right? Digitizing their front end and their back end. And, and we wanted to do it in a comprehensive way. So we didn't find in any research literature enough uh, elements to assess it. And we decided to uh, uh, last year and the beginning of this year, launch a massive uh, survey and study with 300 African companies, uh, which you can see in the next slide, uh, asking them and trying to assess with them, what is their real level of maturity? And if we move to the following slide, the, the, the reality is we wanted to do that in a granular level, looking at three layers, understanding the alignment that those companies have between their overall business strategy and whatever digital or technology roadmap they have in terms of vision, ambition, the, the, the roadmap after that. But we wanted also to understand to which extent that vision trickles down into concrete actions, whether on the digitization of the core, you know, digitizing the go-to-market, the operations, how the support functions, HR journeys are, but also what those African companies do in creating new digital growth um, in, in adjacencies or even in new sectors, which you have, they have not uh, explored so far, using the power of data, the power of, of, of digital outreach. So that was the second layer. But even below that, we wanted to make sure we understand how are the enablers of, of those core digitization or, or new growth. And enablers are in, in three, three buckets, right? One is what we call the new ways of working and that's attracting the talent, having the right organization, having the right ways of working, applying a, agile principles to, to, to get, to get the, the different types of digital talent to work together. So that's one. The second type of enabler we wanted to understand is 
from a technology and data perspective, do we actually have, do companies have the right tech stacks, the right data governance, data utilization that, that would enable them to sustain whatever they're doing on, on the execution front? And then the last one, I will, uh, uh, Patrick has touched upon it and I'll come to it at the very end of the presentation because it's important to understand that the ecosystem element is a critical enabler for digital transformations. Yes, you'll have your own talent and your own organization. Yes, you'll work on, on your own technology, your own data, but we are in a, in a fast moving space where your linkages as a company with um, downstream, so your client and your upstream, so meaning your, your um, suppliers, but also sometimes your competitors, the academic world, this is a critical enabler to secure what you cannot have permanently in-house. So we, we, th this is the framework we used in our study. We have reached out to 300 companies, actually more now, to try and assess their level of maturity in each one of those dimensions. And putting them all together, we have constructed something we call the Digital Acceleration Index, which this study has given us in Africa, but it's, it's a study that we have replicated in all continents. We have a database of, of around 7,000 different companies across uh, continent now, which allowed us to, at the very first cut, see very high level, where do we see, Af see African, African companies' maturity on their digital transformation compared to, to, to the rest of the world. And that's what you'll see in the, in the next slide. It, it, it is a gloomy picture, uh, but it's one that we need to face, right? Compared to, to the rest of the world, our African companies on average are clearly behind. And that is the overall digital maturity assessment that, that, that we have come up with. Now, this picture is, is, is one we need to start with, but we, we should not think it, it summarizes everything. And if you look at the next slide, the first level of granularity you, you wanna ask yourself about is where we are specifically on, at par and where we are delayed. And one of the things we realized is the strategy layer, the top layer I talked about just now, we, we, we don't have that big of a gap, meaning our African company's leadership realizes the burning platform to some extent crafts the vision that, that takes into account the necessary alignment between the business imperatives and, and the technology or digital imperatives. So we see a narrower gap on the strategy. There is still a gap, but much narrower. The biggest gap we see is on all the execution fronts, whether that's on the core business, digitizing the go-to-market, the operations, the, the support functions, but massively also on the enablers. We don't have enough, the, the, the right talent, the right ways of working, the technology is lagging behind. So this is, this is where it's interesting to keep in mind that sometimes this question of digital is not only about vision, and the delay we see, including in, in, in execution, is driven by a lack of enablers around the talent, around the technology, and around the ecosystem. This translates into how we see markets uh, maturing over time. And if we move to the, the next slide, we put a spotlight on one specific industry, e-commerce, right? And basically, it's, it's the story of digitizing retail. And, and we have plotted in here, uh, just to, to give us a perspective into the future, different countries, so China, India, the US, Europe, but also Brazil and some other LATAM countries that are more comparable. Uh, and we try to see how those countries adoption of, of online buying behavior goes, grows with internet penetration as, as a key enabler. So there is good news and bad news. So the, the bad news is Africa, when you look at where we are as an average, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll de-aggregate that because averages do not make sense in Africa, but as an average, uh, we know that we are in the very early part of that journey. Now, the good news is whoever you look at, whether that's India, whether that's uh, Poland, whether that's China, we know there is a path towards a, a better future. We know there will be, a, as we progress in our infrastructure pervasiveness, we will have higher adoption and that will help us get to the right level. Now, the question is how fast we will go there. And, it, and, and that basically is the question for, for the next section. If we move to two slides later, what is the momentum we see for Africa to progress toward that, that adoption pathway? So if you move to the, to the to two slides later um, on the next one, to, to be fair, we have seen momentum even before COVID. And this uh, takes statistics from 2018. We have seen that African consumers are ready, willing, and they actually do 
shift their behavior from the massively offline to gradually more online for influence, for information, and more and more for, for buying behavior directly. Now, it's true also to say, and Patrick has hinted towards that, if we move to the next slide, that the current pandemic has clearly and hopefully irreversibly changed that, that speed of, of shift. That happened for consumers, but it happened also for companies. And to give you an example of that, in, in the next slide, we have conducted a survey for uh, five, the five major, you know, highest GDP um, countries in Africa. This is an example from South Africa. And you see that people are, during the pandemic, shifting dramatically their behavior uh, for what, what we hope to, we get to in, in two or three years. Now we're getting it in a few months. So th that is clearly something that will not change. We'll probably have uh, adjustments down that the now that the lockdown is off, but we see a clear shift that has accelerated in terms of customer behavior. In the following slide, uh, we also see that this trend is true for companies. And I think uh, Mr. Ibrahimi has already cited this survey in the CFC community where the vast majority, six out of 10 companies in our community have either slightly or significantly accelerated their digital transformation roadmap. Of course, there are exceptions. There are companies that already had a high pace, but companies that were hit uh, more, more heavily. Th the message overall is that we have seen acceleration. Now, th the second part of, of the good news is if you move to the next slide, in Africa, we do have best practices. And this is where I want to de-average a little bit the, the first picture. Yes, we are low maturity, 29 compared to, to um, the, the overall world average that's, that's closer to 50. But when you look at the distribution of African companies, the distribution of, Africa, of American, European, Asian, Asian companies, we do have in Africa best in-class examples to get inspiration from. Uh, companies that have exactly the same maturities as the leading European or the leading Asian uh, companies in terms of digital transformation. The, the question that we wanted to, to deep dive into, and I'll, I'll take maybe another two or three minutes to, to put few or anchor few thoughts, which we can come back to uh, later in the, in the panel. What really made those successful companies successful? What are the key elements that can make or break a digital transformation, especially in the, in, in the African context? And in the next section, if we move two slides later, I, I selected three. I mean, there are probably three others that are less important, but given the time, I wanted to focus on, on three key elements that make the, the difference between the digital winners and the wardens who, who are lagging behind in, in, in the African context. So the three differentiators are scale, and scale internally in the company, how to group digital talent, build digital hubs that have a certain critical mass. We apply, we're applying that to ourselves uh, in BCG. And I think Patrick has, has described how the logic of a digital hub in Africa that we're building in Casablanca on AI and on tech is something that, that, that helps us a lot actually go even beyond the continent. The second thing is talent makes the difference. Um, and and this, this sometimes is not intuitive when I say it that way, digital transformation is not a technology problem. It's really not. Like technology, worst case, you can acquire it, right? Or, or externalize it. It's massively a talent issue. If you're lagging behind, it's not likely because you don't have the latest server or the latest, latest cloud service, those you can buy. Uh, it's mainly because we see a lack of talent in our, in, in our continent. And the last one, I, I think that that will be a nice closure of, of the circle, Patrick has mentioned it initially, the, the idea that you need to rely on an ecosystem is unavoidable. And the question is then, how do you build that ecosystem gradually? Now, let me do uh, one minute per, per, uh, per slide for the next three slides to, to highlight some challenges and, and the way forward for each one of those. Uh, scale is not trivial in Africa. And, and by any measure, we've put few in here. If you look at the number of countries in Africa that will um, amass to $1 trillion in GDP, you need 24 of them, uh, at least. In, in Europe, you need only one, well, actually two countries to get there. Um, and, and even in, in uh, Latin America, you would need probably four countries to get there. In Africa, you'd need 24. So, so we are a very fragmented economy. The, the potential that we are looking to capture is, is actually in, it, 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 fragmented in, in more countries than what, we, what you would want. 
Now, this is a challenge because it means that for you to get the right consolidated effort uh, th that has this logic of a hub put in place, you will need also to find a way to integrate many markets and serve many markets at a time. Now, the second point on, on talent, and it links to, to the first point, uh, also uh, sees a very important hurdle. If we can move to the, to the next slide. Um, in many of the African countries we have uh, looked at, and this is a survey that was launched uh, earlier this year, actually before COVID, we see a higher propensity for our African talent to move abroad. This is true for digital talent across the globe, but we see a very high percentage of them that are willing or, or, or even ready to, to make that move. Um, and it's not because they, they don't find the right salary level. I mean, of course, salary is a question, but most importantly, because many of our African companies, the one we have talked to, the one we have included in this study, they are missing the fact that this talent needs a very different employee value proposition. And it's, again, the salary is not the only, actually, it's not even in the top three concerns that those, those people have. It's a lot about opportunity, ways of working, and making sure you, you confront them to the impact of the work that they do. The third element, and that's the last one, I'll, I'll, I'll try and finish it within one minute to, to come back to the panel discussion. And again, I'll, I'll be happy to go into more details in the Q&A. Uh, the logic of, of ecosystem is both important uh, and, and, and actually we know it works. This is the example of, of M-Pesa. I mean, many of you would know M-Pesa uh, started as uh, the, the Kenyan UACSD based payment system. Now it's actually multi-channel and it has built a huge ecosystem around it that goes beyond the mobile payment that includes uh, the mobile health part. It, it includes transportation, energy, banking. And, and this is uh, an ecosystem that's very complex now. It took a number of years to be built, but, but once it is, it, it, it is an enabling in PESA to cover something like 90% of the small value transactions in the country, including the public sector uh, that, that they are managing in their, uh, within their app. So the logic of ecosystem, the logic of orchestrating proactively who you should team up with, and sometimes that means competitors, uh, to, to really bring the best value to your customers is necessary. And, and we see it works. And it works even cross borders. Many of you now um, would know that M-Pesa has uh, built M-Pesa Africa, which is trying to expand into other countries. They have done Tanzania and they're expanding to the rest of, of uh, Eastern Africa to the logic of scale, but also through mainly partnerships, not, not everything needs to be built in-house. So if, if I recap the three elements that really make, make the difference is the scale internally and externally, the talent, it's not a technology battle, it's, it's a talent battle, and three, proactively trying to orchestrate the build of an ecosystem and not do everything by yourself in-house. Manal, I hope I have not uh, taken much more time than, than what I'm supposed to. Again, happy to take questions in the Q&A and elaborate on any point that, that the audience seems um, to, to like or want to go deeper into. Not at all, Emen, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your brilliant presentation. Um, thank you for sharing all these nuggets. You gave us a lot of food for thought and we're gonna dive right into it. Um, Okay, let me check the chat box. How are we feeling so far? Let's drop some messages in the chat box to keep the energy flowing. Type in yes if you're still there and fully engaged with us. We are halfway through our program and we are now moving on to our panel discussion. Um, and then I will keep you on the spot a little longer. You're staying with us uh, for, for, for the panel discussion, of course. We are very happy to have around the table a great panel of speakers representing different perspectives and industries. They will be uh, sharing with us their own journey. I will introduce our guests one by one for the first question to get to know each one of you. And uh, then I might ask you to all switch on your cameras for the second round to have an open conversation and react to everything that has just been said. So let me start with you, Rita Afilel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Rita, you have a strong experience in marketing in the telco and technology industry. You are currently working for SAP, a global technology and solutions providers and CFC member. 
as head of marketing for Francophone Africa region. Prior to SAP, you have spent many years in Microsoft. And before that, you worked both at Inui as Open Innovation Manager and also at Orange. Rita, uh, welcome, first of all. And please tell us what is your approach at SAP when it comes to leading digital transformation? Sure, thank you, Manel, for the introduction. And thank you for giving us the, the opportunity to be part of this discussion as well. Uh, so I think that the development of, uh, of Africa is, uh, is very important and uh, we know it all. And I think that this is why we are all together here uh, today. Uh, so as a key actor in the IT industry, we definitely share responsibility in contributing to this development. And we all know that the development of a nation, of a continent, uh, so like uh, it's the case to date uh, for our debate, uh, goes through its digital transformations. It's a digital transformation. So uh, in that context, SAP's strategy is to um, help every business run uh, as an intelligent enterprise. But before moving uh, deeply and explaining deeply how we do it, we do it uh, it's important uh, to explain uh, how we act. So uh, as SAP, we, we co contribute uh, on, on several levels. So the first level is definitely to accompany the organization in their digital transformation journey and uh, to help them become uh, what we call uh, the intelligent enterprise. So uh, maybe we can uh, share more details on this. So as I was saying, SAP's strategy uh, is to help every business ras, uh, run as an intelligent enterprise and uh, as a market leader in enterprise application software, we help companies all over the world of all sizes, even they are big and large enterprises, but also uh, small and medium businesses, uh, like uh, it's the case for the majority of companies in Africa. Uh, today, just to give you a figure, 80% um, uh, of our customers' portfolio are small and big, big, medium businesses. Uh, so we have accompanied them uh, throughout their uh, their digital journey. So we don't we don't have solutions that uh, uh, only respond to the large enterprises' needs. But it's important to highlight that we can also accompany on a very specific and uh, uh, personalized way, the small and medium businesses as well. Uh, so we have been accompanying them uh, to run at their best. Uh, just to give you more figures uh, in that way, today 77% of the world's transaction revenue touches an SAP system. Uh, in another hand, all the intelligent uh, technologies we are using to uh, put in place our business applications so like uh, machine learning, IoT, uh, advanced analytics technologies as well, uh, helps these businesses turn customer businesses into intelligent enterprise. So uh, with this mix, uh, we definitely, uh, so, 25 industries that we cover, uh, 12 line of uh, businesses. Uh, we have an expertise that we have been developing throughout uh, 45 years. Uh, and at the end of the day, digital, digitalization is all about transforming businesses, uh, business processes while improving uh, your sales by satisfying your customers. And uh, with this mix, uh, we, we are definitely in a pole position uh, to, 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 I mean, to help and uh, accompany the organization in, their, uh, in, in Africa in their digital journey. So this was the first level so for the, the digitalization. So this uh, support and uh, uh, help for businesses. Uh, the second level, and this one is very important as well, is uh, youth, 
youth and uh, when it comes to, to, to their education and their employability. So we all know that uh, today in, in Africa, uh, like we said, as a, a key actor in the digital in, in, uh, transformation, we need uh, to contribute uh, to bridge the, the, the digital skills. Uh, to, 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 to make sure and to empower uh, the, the, the youth in Africa uh, to, to, to meet the, the, the recruiters' requirements when it comes to, to, to skills. So how we do it? Uh, we have two main initiatives. So uh, the first one is called uh, Africa Code Week. So we, we, we act uh, very early uh, in the childhood, so uh, this this program concerns the the, the young people uh, between eight and sixteen years. Um, so the Africa Code Week uh, initiatives has been launched, of course, not but SAP only, but together with uh, with strong partners like uh, UNESCO, Irish Aid, and uh, and also ADEA, so uh, Association for Development and uh, of Education in Africa. And uh, the objective of this initiative is uh, the integration of coding in the school curricula. So we can put the light on the Morocco example. Uh, so just to give you more details about this program, uh, Africa Code Week uh, definitely became the framework for digital skills learning via Scratch in all Moroccan schools. And uh, since 2015, the year where uh, this uh, program has been launched, uh, we could, so the program, so we could as SAP together with our partners, empower more than 30,000 teachers in Morocco to install coding and comp computational thinking in their classroom. Uh, so we also, uh, we were also able to um, uh, to engage with us uh, more than six million youth. So uh, this represents a whole generation of future coders, and we know how coding is important today in the in the in the skills and in the thinking we are asking uh, the, the mindset we are asking uh, uh, for the skills that the recruiters are. Are looking for when it comes to to IT uh, expertise. Yes, uh, absolutely, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, talentful <laughs> is definitely key, um, and uh, and th that's been one of the main highlights uh, of the of the publication. And we're going to get a chance to get back to it, uh, Rita. Thank you so much for sharing these first uh, um, uh, nuggets on your side. I. I I would like, in the interest of time, to, to turn to you, uh, Jérôme, and um, thank you also for accepting our invitation. Uh, Jérôme, you, we are neighbors here in the CFC First Tower. Uh, you have joined uh, Orange 20 years ago, and you're currently the B2B Strategy, Marketing, and Performance Director for uh, Orange Middle East and Africa. Um, you previously led a major transformation and performance improvement program for uh, Orange Egypt and Orange Jordan. Um, and we actually have a great case study on Orange uh, in our joint publication with BCG because there's, there's so much to say. We are following with great interest the deployment of the Orange digital centers across Africa. Jérôme, can you share with us a few insights in a couple minutes on how Orange is empowering the digital transformation on the continent. Then we'll get that all together for uh, in-depth conversation. Back uh, over to you, Jérôme. Sure, thank you, Manel. Uh, thanks for having me on this panel and good morning, everyone. Um, just quickly to set the scene, uh, Orange Middle East and Africa, the multi-service operator, as you said, we are headquartered here in Casablanca, so we're an African company, serving 124 million customers in 18 countries. And we are fully committed to the digital development of the continent. So digital is our bread and butter. It's uh, really our daily uh, life and we are constantly adapting, starting internally. Uh, we cannot support digital transformation outside uh, without starting inside. So we have a strong program uh, in orange to transform, bring more digital agility, focusing on digital skills and using uh, digital and data in many areas uh, for smarter networks, uh, energy optimization, 
uh, of course, more critically for the enhancement of uh, customer experience, for example, with uh, more digital channels and uh, dedicated applications like uh, MyOrange, for example. This all serves to uh, empower our customers in their own digital transformation uh, throughout Africa. Uh, as uh, Aman mentioned earlier, there is a real uh, challenge with, uh, with connectivity. So we are starting with uh, bringing affordable connectivity to support digital inclusion. Actually, we invest 1 billion euro annually in digital infrastructure, uh, both nationally. Uh, in each country, we have 28 million 4G customers and a strong uh, program for uh, rural uh, coverage, but also internationally with uh, the big uh, submarine cables up to Africa or uh, our own uh, multi-country West Africa backbone, which is called Joriba, which was launched recently. Uh, as I guess uh, you are aware, uh, Orange is also one of the pioneers in uh, uh, digital finance services and mobile money. We have over 50 million Orange Money customers uh, throughout the continent, of which 20 million are active every month. We do support companies and institutions with their own digital transformation, with uh, consulting and services, cloud, cybersecurity, smart solutions, for example, in uh, smart energy, smart metering, uh, transportation, sometimes using uh, data coming from the network, uh, demographics, of course, anonymized, but it's a great help. Uh, we are also developing uh, so-called mobile for development solutions, for example, in the field of agriculture. We have signed recently in Ivory Coast the support to the rice sector, e-health, remote diagnostic and care, vaccine monitoring, which is coming handy these days, of course, and education. We have our own Orange Campus uh, Africa, which was uh, launched recently to give access to, uh, to content. Um, it was mentioned also by Amen earlier in the report, the importance of, uh, of digital talent for Africa. So we strongly support education to digital and education through digital with different programs. Uh, we have a digital schools program, Education Pass, which gives privilege access internet to uh, content. Uh, we also have, as was mentioned uh, by CP just before, uh, a, a super coder program, coding and robotics for the uh, school uh, pupils. Uh, we also agreed it's, it's an important uh, uh, starting point. Uh, actually, those coding academies are part of our Orange Digital Centers, uh, which we are gradually opening in all our uh, Middle East and Africa countries. These are centers dedicated to digital innovation. They also include the Solidarity Fab Labs and uh, for digital prototyping and uh, Orange Fab Startup Accelerators. Um, the startup ecosystem is important. It was mentioned uh, earlier as well. We are supporting the uh, digital entrepreneurship uh, through business coaching, but also through funding. We have our own seed fund, Orange Ventures Africa, with 50 million euro. And we are uh, helping uh, hundreds of uh, startup to start to grow. And we are using them as part of our uh, uh, offering. So we are co cooperating business-wise with them. So that was just, uh, uh, for the sake of time, a very short overview of uh, how we become more digital internally within Orange and how we uh, probably empower the digital transformation of uh, all our African customers, be they consumers or uh, companies and institutions. Thank you so much, Jerome, for sharing that impressive uh, initiatives. Indeed, we'll talk more about it. Um, now we're going to be traveling all the way to um, Eastern Africa. Uh, Rwanda is increasingly becoming a hub of uh, tech activity uh, with countless digital initiatives at all levels. The latest one is Kigali Innovation City, a flagship project launched by the government of Rwanda. CFC is actually a proud partner of the new financial center in Rwanda, KIIC. Um, maybe some of the colleagues are connected uh, here today. I saw them registered. Um, we, we'll be working together on attracting investment for the continent, but today we are focusing on the technology aspect and we are delighted to welcome Philippe Gassatura, currently project director at Kigali Innovation City. Philip, how are you doing today? 
Very well, and uh, thank you for having us, and uh, we're glad to be here. It's so great to have you. Um, Philip, you're a serial entrepreneur and investor. You became a founding partner of New Food Company Holdings, a UK-based private investment firm focused on identifying scalable opportunities within the FMCG sector in East Africa. You have been a senior finance and technology specialist with over 15 years working experience in investment banking in the UK. So thank you for being with us and please tell us more about Kigali Innovation City and how you see yourselves contributing to the digital transformation in Africa. Thank you once again. Um, I think as uh, Banal has mentioned, Kigali Innovation City is a, is a government project uh, that looks at how to nurture Rwanda to become an innovation ecosystem and a Pan-African hub. Because today, as mentioned earlier, there's a lot of activity. I think uh, it was mentioned what uh, BCG's research and the report coming out, there's a lot of activity. And Rwanda wants to see herself play a role in uh, fostering that and uh, attracting and being able to play its role on the African continent. And Kigali Innovation City's mission is to nurture and accelerate this place to become a, a Pan-African hub. But more so in particular, there is the a proof of concept hub. And I think uh, earlier on, um, it was mentioned that uh, we've had some drone companies come here. Uh, one of them was uh, Zipline that came through here, uh, testing the use of uh, drones within medical, medical facilities and being able to transport medical drugs and uh, materials that are needed in far to reach places. And we've had a number of that, those. But the idea is to support, to attract some of these innovators, uh, to provide support, to test the ideas and enable them to expand their innovations into other African markets. Rwanda, of course, um, a lot like uh, uh, other parts of Africa, looking at Rwanda, why Rwanda? It's a fast growing economy, uh, low risk, uh, good business friendly uh, environment and a regional platform to the rest of Africa. Now, we are obviously very cognizant that Rwanda is a, uh, for those who may not know, it is in the middle, in Eastern Africa, but really at the heart of Africa. And we like to consider ourselves the heart of Africa. And from here, able to reach many parts of East and Central Africa. Within Kigali Innovation uh, City, and I think uh, it was mentioned earlier by uh, Aman, talent is critical. And so what we have been doing within uh, Kigali Innovation City, which is a physical campus that is being built out uh, here in Kigali, is to attract and grow a Pan-African pool of talent. Uh, we, and so to do that, we have attracted the likes of Carnegie Mellon uh, University to position their, position their Africa campus here in Rwanda. Uh, there is the Africa Institute of Mathematical Sciences that is also within the campus, uh, the Africa Leadership University, um, and a number of others within the medical space and uh, the agriculture space. Again, as mentioned earlier, looking at being that proof of concept destination to test ideas and to scale from here to the rest of Africa and to the world. A number of those we've attracted is the Volkswagen, uh, where they've launched their pilot uh, electric uh, cars here, and they're testing their mobility solutions. Others in this space in transportation are the mass uh, market for electric motorbikes, because in this part of the world, uh, in East Africa, motorbikes is your uh, is almost the most common form of transportation or the most uh, used form of transportation, which use, does consume a lot of fossil fuels. And so they're looking at how do you move that to electricity? You're looking at uh, drones, but also another firm that is he has come here uh, from the US is called Babel. Uh, that I've pioneering AI uh, within uh, digital health services. Uh, we're here in Rwanda, about 95% of our population are covered under the national uh, health insurance coverage. And so that does help uh, reduce the time and costs. And from here, a number of them that I have mentioned have also scaled beyond from here, beyond Rwanda in the transportation space, in the uh, drone space, um, as well as in the um, healthcare space as well. Now, critical to that is a real estate, as I mentioned, and we are partnering with uh, partners uh, who are Africa 50, who, uh, uh, as it may be, are actually have their headquarters out in uh, Casablanca. And together we are building out this and attracting private sector players to develop the real estate, but also in terms of driving the innovative companies to come here. Um, 
one of those that we do like to say about Rwanda is you get things done here. Uh, and a lot of the regulatory environments, uh, similar to what we did work with, uh, the drone companies have been able to be fostered here. And we like to find ourselves as a creative and innovative regulatory environment that allows for these to be tested and scaled. So maybe I'll pause there um, uh, and uh, hand back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip, for uh, for sharing this. Indeed, Africa 50, member of the CFC community, and we are we're so glad to have to to see and to witness the the, the work of our members covering 50 um, countries in in Africa. Thank you, everyone, for this first round. I would like to invite you now to switch uh, your webcams on and uh, let's have a conversation. I want to save us some time to address some of the questions of our audience. Some of them are um, already posted. Um, and then we have a lot of reactions to your presentation. Um, let me- That's a good sign. About, yeah. Um, and we have actually a lot of questions for, for, for everyone I can see here. I'm just discovering all the questions. I encourage you all to drop your messages uh, and questions and uh, let, let's, let's uh, take some time to address these shall we? So we have a question from Job. Um, who are some of the best in class companies and in what verticals do we see them? In other words, are there some more verticals that are more poised for being best in class in Africa? Amen, would you like to take this one? Yeah, I'll do a quick answer and, and then this is a discussion that, that we can take offline as well. We see a clear trend. So some industries uh, have, have as an average, a better maturity than others. I, I can cite mainly telco and banking. Uh, some of the reasons are also because there are, those are industries that are technology heavy. Uh, they have attracted more or less the right talents in the past. So it, it, it is some sort of a structural advantage. That's not to say that, I don't know, heavy um, asset industries are structurally need to be behind. That's not true. Actually, we've seen some uh, mining companies that have done a lot of, uh, especially data and analytics work to optimize their operations. It's just on average, we see that telco and, uh, and banking have an edge. Okay, great. Um, let's take quickly a second question and then uh, kick off our, our conversation. Um, so we have a question from <clears throat> Mahwan. To what extent cybersecurity and data privacy issues are challenges in digitalizing Africa? Um, to what extent African regulations are ready for that? Anyone wants to take on this question? Maybe Jérôme? Um, yes, sure. Uh, and de definitely cybersecurity is one of the uh, challenges uh, to, to be addressed. And uh, in this period of uh, COVID crisis, where there have been a lot more uh, remote workers and a lot of more digital interactions, we have seen a, a rise in uh, cybersecurity issues. The, we, what we notice with our customers is that the awareness for cybersecurity is not always there yet. Uh, definitely less than in other geographies, but it's uh, it's coming, and um, and we as uh, other uh, actors in this area are here to, to support. Um, I'm not sure I can answer specifically on the regulatory part, uh, but definitely we put a lot of attention on the uh, uh, privacy and and what we do with data. That's one of the reasons uh, why we do have, uh, for example, data centers in African countries and why we are developing uh, networks such as Joliba to keep uh, African data within Africa. Okay, Manal, maybe just to complement Jerome's point, sure. two sentences on, on the regulation, because that we actually have a, a round table tomorrow in Morocco, speci specifically about the regulation in, in digital uh, with the American Chamber of Commerce. Now, if, if you're doing as a company only what the regulation is asking you for, you're behind. That, that, like that's the one sentence I want to say. It, it it is by far not sufficient to protect you, whether that's on the cybersecurity front or in the trust, because there is also elements that that come from the customer's trust, ir irrespective of what the regulation um, says. So just we are behind clearly in in all African countries I've looked at at least, 
so companies need to do way more than what the strict minimum of the regulation says. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for adding that. Um, we're going to be taking more questions. Let me just pick off the the, the, the open question, and um, this is this is also for you in the audience. Like, t type up uh, your your thoughts. And uh, as I said, we have a lot of uh, expertise in the audience as well. So please contribute with your thoughts. So this is an open question to all our guests. In your opinion, what is needed? to rise to the digital challenge in Africa? What do we really need to do to accelerate the pace? And what would be some of your key recommendations? We've gone through some of them, but let, let's let's crack this up, okay? Uh, Rita, would you like to go first with this? Sure, thank you, uh, Manel. So uh, yes, I think that there are uh, several uh, uh, areas. So uh, of course, uh, the, the, the first one, and I, I, I uh, I mean, I started uh, uh, sharing this with you, uh, is accompanying the right way the businesses in their digital journey. Uh, the second one is to work closely with the gover government uh, decision makers uh, to make sure that uh, every and single uh, IT actor uh, in the in, 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 in this area can bring his help to, to, to contribute in developing more IT skills, uh, to build bridges and uh, to help employers find the right resources um, uh, when it comes to, to, to IT expertise. And in that sense, we can share, so we shared the Africa Code Week um, uh, initiative, but we also have another one that tackles more uh, the underemployed and unemployed brilliant uh, students um, uh, through a two to three uh, month program that allowed them to get certified, trade and certified uh, on the most innovative um, uh, IT solutions uh, with regard to SAP. And this is a kind of, of uh, I, I will just take the time to, to explain a little bit more. And this is the kind of, uh, of project that uh, we, we call a four win project because this make happy, uh, of course, the beneficiary but also the, 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 the country, because they have uh, less in employment, less people in the, in the streets, uh, the employer as well. Uh, today, we, we, we ensure that these uh, young people um, uh, can uh, meet the right job opportunities within our SAP ecosystem. So the, the, the recruiters are happy as well because they find the, the right people with the right skills. And at the end of the day, the impact is bigger than that because we know that in our uh, uh, countries, so in Africa countries, we still have this community and family values. So when someone uh, is uh, properly employed and uh, uh, this impacts uh, a full community behind. So we were, most of the time we are talking about uh, uh, even 10 people. Uh, so uh, because of this, um, uh, help-based value, so they help the, the uncle, the, the aunt, the cousin, so uh, the, 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 the impact is definitely bigger, uh, and today we managed to, to place, so we have 99% uh, of, uh, of uh, people getting recruited. Uh, so we have businesses, we have uh, education and skills and employment, but I think that another important thing is uh, environment. So putting in place the IT solutions that will drive, uh, that will help the country or the continent to, to or the organization at a, a smaller uh, perspective to, 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 to embrace their digital journey while being respectful to the environment. And uh, uh, we know that uh, as an IT actor, we can provide some solutions that are eco-friendly. And uh, uh, one of them that is uh, in top of my mind is cloud. We, defi we all definitely know that uh, by, by going through, through uh, cloud solutions, we have, just to give you some figures, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the mutualization of, of resources and needs, uh, and we have 77% less fewer servers, just to give you an idea and put things in perspective, and the 84% uh, 
less power. So these yeah, are the definitely insights. Definitely gives a lot of impact, yeah. Yeah. And environmental friendly. That, that, that's, that's really a key question, uh, Rita, and I'm, I'm glad you're, you're raising, raising that. Um, and I know that a lot of the, the, the audience and also investors are getting more and more keen on on the, their, their, their carbon footprint, their environmental absolutely. footprint. So that's absolutely something we need to keep in mind. And it's a perfect transition to, to, a, to a question from Abhijit that wants to address it to, to the panel. How good or bad is the current trust factor to rely on new digital solutions? Um, and, uh, Philip, maybe you wanna take this question. From, from your point sure. of view, how, how do you see the current trust factor in Africa with yeah. regards to digital solutions? Funny enough, I had that as one of the biggest challenges uh, to, to, to discuss. Uh, but I, I like that uh, in what Aman did in the documentation, it, it was pointed out. When you look at e-commerce, um, a lot of it is still done by cash on delivery. I think having done business uh, on the continent for a number of years, I think one of the biggest uh, commodities or the highest valued commodities is, is trust. Can I, if I give you my money, will I get it? Uh, and that's a big primary um, issue. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges with the uh, e-commerce as well. It plays a role both in the relationship with government, in the relationship with the private sector. And, and so you tend to find even where those who do have money uh, I, I grew up in I grew up in Uganda, and one of the uh, the local language saying there is the eyes are in the hands. If I don't touch it, I don't trust it. And you see that in different countries, they have their different uh, similar proverbial uh, language to it. But it is if I I need to touch it to believe it. And so you see a slow uptake of of the e-commerce um, where people even to make payments. Uh, we can make our digital has moved towards the payments because even uh, in this neck of the woods, uh, when M-Pesa started and today MTN is here, it's taken a while for them. And uh, to your point earlier, COVID has moved that, shifted that. Um, but people are using it more for making payments for known products. It's my water bill, it's my electricity, it's a few services. But to make an e-commerce transaction, it's, it's still a challenge to get over the, over the line. And so I think it, it plays a critical role um, in, in establishing uh, trust. And to a man's point earlier, uh, regulation is not going to all of a sudden uh, whip up some trust in it. So companies need to be doing a bit more to establish that trust. Uh, I know one of the companies uh, in, in Nairobi where um, what they have done is they have gotten youth from this company. They do e-commerce and they go door to door which is what you saw back in the uh, 1900s, what uh, I think one of the American companies, Sears, did that. They had salespeople going door to door. Now that is able to build some level of trust because I can go to a door and a youth, a young lady, young uh, man will stand there and order, help them order uh, the products. But that creates a level of trust and companies need to figure out and do a bit more in trying to establish that trust uh, and, and that loyalty with the customers. I think uh, to his point, trust is a very big, uh, big issue. And it is a market demand as opposed to a supply. Then once the market gets it, they will demand it and everything else falls in place. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Philip. Um, Jérôme, we have a question for you. We're taking uh, one more question from, from the audience. Thank you everyone for interacting. We appreciate that. Um, so, uh, DJ or DJ, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, great work you are doing at Orange. Have, how have you been able to navigate the regulatory environment? We have more questions about the regulatory environment. Um, how have you been able to work with the team to achieve the digitiz digitalization objectives? Um, so, and a last question from the same person, would you say the regulators have caught on to the digital future? Jérôme, would you like to give uh, some uh, insights on, on this? Uh, yes, thanks, Qu quick insight. I mean, definitely regulators are, are, are key stakeholders in, in our area. I mean, telecom is a strongly regulated uh, domain. So we, we do cooperate uh, very uh, closely with uh, regulators in all uh, geographies where we operate. And we try to be uh, very 
constructive and, and proactive. We, we don't just wait for new regulations to fall on our head, which sometimes happen, but we also uh, make uh, constant proposals to the regulators, uh, helping them to better understand the reality of the, of the market, not only from the telco point of view, but from the end user point of view. And sometimes uh, we find uh, interesting solutions uh, together uh, with, with the rest of this, uh, of this telco ecosystem. So, so yes, uh, we, we, we do work as a team with the regulators. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's needed and it's very important uh, for the acceleration of uh, digital in, in Africa. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and um, we, we, we work closely with the regulators and uh, we're, we're looping them in and uh, making sure that the questions will be uh, also directed uh, to them. Last question from um, Yassine, um, and this is an open one for all my panelists. What is still missing in African cities to aspire become living labs for smart and innovative services and solutions? Want to take this one? Hey, Maya, can you can you repeat what is missing from the African cities? What is missing in the African cities to become living labs um, for smart and innovative services? In your opinion, what would that be? Yeah. So so maybe I'll I'll throw something, and and the rest of the team will, will probably have other ideas. We we can do a long list of things that are missing. There is one for me that made a huge difference you know for countries or cities who have stepped up their game is the openness of platforms we we have heard a lot of talk about open data uh singapore did something that i found brilliant uh, the the government itself has put in place an open data platform not only on their own data but sensors in the streets that can be accessed by startups who want to try something, want to capture a data and make something useful out of it, a useful service. So I think the openness of an infrastructure that other people can plug into would decrease significantly the cost of failure to innovators and startups. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's, it's about time for us to wrap up. Unfortunately, I know these sessions go by so fast. Um, we, we, we are seeing and reading all your comments, all your questions, and we'll make sure to revert back to you. Um, please let, let us your, uh, your, your questions if you have any. We have also uh, left the QR code uh, for all our panelists for you to get in touch with them. I want to, uh, once again, before I do a quick summary, thank our speakers and panelists very, very much for participating and making this a great program. Um, to summarize our key takeaways, first, as Amen said, see the future. We have learned and we have heard from Orange, who has been a leader in leveraging scale across Africa with its digital centers. Second, invest in digital talent, very important. SAP has launched a program in bridging the digital skills gap in Africa. We've heard from the uh, Kigali uh, initiative as well. Third, develop new ways uh, of working. Digital success demands agile ways of working and that does not come naturally uh, to a great number of uh, companies. Fourth, build a digital ready IT infrastructure, overcome rigid IT systems, the company can take advantage of scale and costs and benefits. And lastly, the fifth point, uh, pick your unicorns, focus your energy on a few of the potentially most impactful initiatives rather than spreading resources over many initiatives. If you want to deep dive into each of these recommendations, go download the full report. Um, we have the report available for you. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but you have the full uh, report available for you on our website. Um, just tag the QR code, it will take you right to it. It has been a lively discussion with great insights. On behalf of CFC and Boston Consulting Group, I would like to thank you all for joining us. We, when we close this webinar, um, a quick survey will appear on the screen. We like to know how we've done um, so if you could take just a few seconds to answer it, it would be greatly appreciated. It's 11.15. This concludes our remarks for today. Again, thanks to everyone, co-hosts, speakers, and audience. 
please be safe out there and we wish you a very very happy and healthy new year and this concludes our broadcast thank you thank you Manal. thank you everyone thank you Manal. thanks everyone thank you